Welcome to the Life in the Red podcast presented by the Lincoln Journal Star, your source for Husker news, analysis, and more. From football in the fall to recruiting in the summer, we've got you covered. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Bassnett, Parker Gabriel, and Stephen M. Sippel. Three, two, one. Welcome in. Life in the Red podcast. I'm Chris. There's Parker. There's Steve. It's uh, 4.42 p.m. on uh, Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. Coming to you live from Lincoln. Well, by the time you watch this, it won't be live, but coming to you from Lincoln, Nebraska. We're a couple of days out from Nebraska at Wisconsin football. We're one day past the Nebraska Creighton basketball uh, game on Tuesday night. We'll touch on that, but plenty to talk about. Uh, on both fronts. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to start with football. It's obviously been, it's been a couple of weeks uh, around this program. Um, Nebraska announcing Scott Frost will return. Scott Frost firing four offensive assistants, um, uh, elevating some staffers, some, some, some GAs, things of that nature into those positions. And so we'll, I think we start with that, you know, and there hasn't been a lot of movement on the coaching front so far as far as offensive coordinator, things like that, I guess, what have you guys been here and what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead, Parker, lead it off. Yeah, it just, there hasn't been, there hasn't been a ton of concrete information out there um, about how wide the net, you know, how wide they're casting the net um, exactly what the search looks like. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk, obviously. The thing that, the thing that I find interesting is, sort of where I'm very curious. I'm going to ask Scott about this on Thursday when we talk to him. So some people listening, you know, perhaps this will already have been answered, but one of the things I'm curious about is Frost said originally that he wanted the, you know, the offensive coordinator position filled as fast as possible. I totally like, I get that. And that, that may well be the case, but man, I mean, there's already 12 head coaching openings. There's more to come. There's 12. Is there 12? Um, there's 12. 12. Not like in the big 10, but in division one. Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. And so, and there's more to come. And so I just, it's going to be, it's already being, you know, referred to as one of the craziest coaching carousel seasons in a while. And the season's not even close to being over yet. I mean, teams (laughs) that are playing for a conference championship, that's like three weeks from now still. So I just, um, it is a, really bizarre landscape to operate in if you're Scott Frost and, and the people that are helping Scott sort of identify candidates. Um, guys are still coaching. A lot of people are out of jobs and you don't know like who, who's going to be uh, a job candidate in a couple of weeks, who might be a head coaching candidate four weeks from now. Like it's a really, um, it is a really big, uh, it's a really important critical hire that Scott has to get done here. And he's operating in a landscape. That's just um, pretty wild. Uh, I would call it a landscape of complications and I would, I, you could frame it up in a, in a variety of ways. Like, okay, what do I mean by complications? I'll give you an example. Okay. How about you have designs on a offensive coordinator who's in a job, but knows that job is ending but doesn't really want to talk to anybody right now. He doesn't want to talk to anybody till the end of the season. Okay. Till the end of their season. So, so guys, two weeks away, you can't even talk to a guy you might be targeting. Um, Cause he, cause he doesn't entertain those calls during the season, but you have targeted it. What? Okay. Another complication. What if you target an offensive coordinator who wants autonomy on his staff? If you're going to ask me, if, 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 if you're going to ask me as an offensive coordinator to whip around an offense in one year, I'm going to say, well, I want my, I want an offensive line coach yeah. that I can pick a receivers coach that I can pick and a running backs coach. I can pick if Nebraska is unwilling to do that, which I think they might be, well, that's a complication, right? Um, what's another complication. You got to get this thing turned around fast. Are you looking for offensive coordinators who can bring a quarterback with them? You might be, I would, I would try. Um, there's a zillion, there's a lot of moving parts in this conversation. And I just gave you one example of a coach that, you know, I mean, he he might just take himself out of it or Nebraska might take him out of it just because he doesn't want to talk till the end of the season. 
which is a pretty com- it's fairly common for that to happen. Yeah, and then and then one of the things I was thinking about this morning too is let's say right now you just hit a home run, you know, you got an offensive coordinator who is universally regarded as holy cow, how'd they get that guy? Or wow, what a great hire. I mean, who's to say that? I mean, the head coaching candidates that are going to end up at the places that are open right now, LSU, USC, uh, all of these places, like they're going to create openings then. Like if Florida fires Dan Mullen, there's going to be people lining up for the Florida job. Whoever yeah. gets that job is probably going to be a head coach. I mean, there's only so many former coaches or NFL guys or whatever, they're going to fill those jobs. So, you know, this happened to USC uh, with Cliff Kingsbury. That was a unique situation, obviously. He got an NFL head coaching job, but that sort of thing happens where a guy gets a job and then in sort of the second round, um, he might be a head coaching candidate somewhere. So I just think there's a lot of landmines. There's a lot of complications. Um, there's a lot of ways you could go. I mean, you could look for a young up or up, up and comer, you know, um, Lincoln Riley's brother, Garrett is a 31 year old offensive coordinator who's putting up big numbers this year. Um, Where's he at? Uh, Western Kentucky, Garrett Riley, I think. Um, passing offense in the country. Yeah. You know, you could go look for the guy at, at uh, Wake Forest, Warren Ruggiero. You know, he's been with the same head coach for a long time. He's been with Dave Clawson going back to when they were at BYU. Um, maybe a guy like that doesn't want to doesn't want to leave the head coach he's worked with for a long time. You know, there's other guys out there um, who have who, who are experienced – that would be sort of like having a quasi uh, head coach, you know, a, a guy who could, who, you know, you can trust to run it. Eh, maybe he's got a more comfortable situation where he's at. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of candidates out there. And I, I, the people I've talked to all seem like more confident than I would have thought that Nebraska has got good candidates out there that they can make a run at. The tough part, obviously, is navigating the landscape as it currently is and then actually getting it across the finish line and getting somebody to Lincoln. Yeah. Now, Scott's getting help from Matt Davidson. I know that. Um, and I don't know. I don't think it goes too far beyond Davidson. Um, I mean, the thing I would wonder and I don't know is to what extent Trev Alberts is helping. Um, and I don't know that. Um, but I know Matt is helping. Um, and I, and I, I would think there could be others, um, but I would say, are you helping Steve? Are you helping? I could for a fee. Yes. Um, very smart. There would have to be a a significant fee. A hefty fee. Yeah. Yeah. As you guys know, I like side gigs. Um, and I would definitely, (laughs) I would definitely entertain that. Then you could turn around and write about it in the Journal Star, and man, you would just uh-huh. you'd, you'd break <laughs> the news. We do, that in, we do that in our business now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you guys. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hey, 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 Scott. Hey, Scott. This is a great idea for a column. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Scott. How about that guy at Army? Oh yeah, they'll run the ball. No, no. Uh, Garrett just... Riley. Garrett Riley's at SMU. Ah, uh, SMU. There you go. Okay, wait a second. Garrett Riley's Lincoln Riley's brother. Believe it or not. Yeah. Thirty-two years old. Thirty-two. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I want a more. Uh, you want a sixty-two-year-old, not a thirty-two-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Maybe a seventy-two-year-old. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, all right. What else is on your collection? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I I don't really have anything to add, but it's like you guys like you nailed it perfect. Like it's Nebraska football, so of course there's a million complications to this. Like not that there wouldn't be with any other program. Like it's just going to be. It's going to be hard. Um, I think one of the, one of the things Baz, before, I think we'll probably go to the hot topic next, but one of the things I'm interested in, in all of this is the conversation that one of the complications simply you mentioned is autonomy because Frost said uh, what he when he talked last week that if he were a coordinator being hired, he'd want to have some say in, you know, a guy or two that you feel strongly about. So I'm, I wonder, I think, what it sounds like is perhaps the line is somewhere between you're going to get who you get and like it and you can pick whoever you want. So, you know, that's the, I think that's another, it's just another, like people ask me, Oh, what do you think for O line coach or receivers coach or whatever? And it's like, well, 
doesn't that some of that depend on what position the coordinator coaches? I mean, if the sure. coordinator is a quarterback specialist, then you don't need a standalone quarterbacks coach like Mario Verduzco was. If the guy feels really strongly about coaching the O-line, then that changes your board a little bit in terms of, you know, how you put the pieces together. Like Josh Lynn at UNK? Is that, what's that? How, what, what, what are you talking about? Oh, jo- no, I'm just I'm making it. Does joke. he coach Josh, offensive line? Josh Lynn is the head coach and also, also coaches the offensive line for the Lopez. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, Bass. No, I find that interesting because – I guess in a like a perfect world that doesn't exist, it would be great if Nebraska had an OC offensive line coach because the offensive line is the biggest problem. I mean, that yep. is the problem. In fact, if you I bet if you were an offensive coordinator and, and you had and you were thinking about the Nebraska job, you would flip on film, you would you would you would talk to people close to it, you would turn on film, and what would you see? You would see a a, a quarterback under pressure 70% of the time and tackles that, that you don't have to be Matt Millen to pick out the struggle Nebraska has up front on the edges. And yeah. now, I mean, that would be killing two birds with one stone. You get an offensive coordinator and a guy that might um, be able to, to expedite that improvement process and maybe even bring a tackle or two with it. Is that am I going too far against the I mean, I'm not saying that Corcoran and Ben Hart can't improve. Um, and you know, you have Teddy Prohaska coming off an injury, but I don't know. I mean I think yeah, I don't think you're going too far in the I don't think you're going too far in the, the conversation about the O line. Obviously, quarterback's gonna be a question one way or another after the year in terms of yeah, does Adrian come back? Um, does he not? Uh, it feels like they're going to have to recruit someone out of the portal, no matter what, maybe a coordinator or quarterbacks coach has a guy either where he eventually comes from or has a connection to somebody else or whatever. Um, I think for my money, this has no bearing on what Nebraska is going to do. The guy's in a really good spot for my money. The, the, if I was picking an OC out of everybody, I might take Jeff Grimes from Baylor. Um, they're really Really, really balanced at BYU with Zach Wilson the past couple of years, um, and they turned around Baylor. I mean, he Dave Aranda is obviously in his second year there, um, but you know if they've turned Baylor into physical, tough, um, balanced. You know, they're two hundred plus rushing and passing on a week in, week out basis. You look what they did on the ground against Oklahoma last week. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be done. You can turn it around in in one year, um, but it takes the right mix of people obviously um and it doesn't happen overnight so it's a huge undertaking for nebraska this is a uh, a good place to segue to the hot topic i believe and it's gonna we're gonna continue on this theme of talking about scott Frost's coaching staff and how he might fill it out and you know one of the one of the one of the hot button topics all year has been nebraska's special teams play so the the hot topic is this as scott frost fills out this staff Will he hire a special teams coordinator as, as part of these assistant hires he has to make in the, in the next month or two? Baz, you haven't talked much. What do you think? I think he should. Uh, now, will he? I don't know. I think he should because – well, and, I mean, I don't really need to make a whole lot of an argument because Nebraska has made that argument for me. All you have to do is look at, look at the results there, um, you know, the past three years, four years, and – and see that, and, and Scott Frost has, has made some good points that Nebraska's coverage has improved dramatically this year, and it has. There's no question about that, but they're not a threat to return kicks. They're not a threat to return punts. They make half their field goals. They miss a few extra points. Um, punting game has had really good moments and also had some really, really bad moments. So it's easy to say, well, yeah, we've, we've made improvements, but you've made improvements in one of several areas that you need to improve in special teams. So if it's me – yeah, you. I think you need to hire a special teams coordinator. I think that's why, and you guys kind of touched on this, why it's important to hire an offensive coordinator that that also has another responsibility, whether that's quarterbacks or receivers, what whatever it may be, so you can keep a spot open. So will he hire one? I don't know. Should he hire one? I think he should. Parker, go ahead. An interesting conversation. I don't, I don't really believe that he will. Um, especially not in the first order of things. Like if I'm being honest and I, again, it's just sort of guesswork and having watched how they've operated for the last four years, 
I think if that were to happen, it'd be more likely if the defensive side of the staff is affected at some point. Like if a guy leaves on the defensive side, which is always a possibility, like there's coaching turnover almost every off season, uh, even when you don't initiate it by firing four guys. I, to me, that seems like the most likely, um, you know, potential shakeup. And, and it's logical, I guess, because that's where the majority of the special teams duties lie. Now, uh, Mike Dawson's the outside linebackers coach, and he's also the special teams coordinator. So it wouldn't have to be him necessarily. I just think the more natural restructure to include a special teams coordinator probably um, includes, you know, change on that side of the ball or comes as a result of change on that side of the ball. But I mean, then the second part, okay. So then the second part of the conversation is what, it, what do we actually mean by that? Is it somebody that only coaches special teams? Because I think if you look around the country, there are like, you know, I think a lot of special teams coordinators have a position, you know, I, and so I don't, if you do that, if you hire a guy who's overseeing a better special teams unit than Nebraska, and you also want him to coach running backs or you want him to coach corners or whatever, all you're doing is replacing Mike Dawson as the person who coaches special yeah. teams and also has positional responsibility. And that's what mm -hmm. I think when Scott said he thought Mike Dawson's done a good job, I think that's what he meant is like, I don't see hiring somebody to just be exactly what Mike Dawson is, but just not him. Yeah, it's somewhat of a complicated conversation as, as this is, this tends to be, it seems. I, uh, I like, see, here's the thing, Baz and Parker, the, the current setup, I don't think is that bad with Dawson and Bill Bush. I mean, Bill mm -hmm. Bush handling a lot behind the scenes structure scheme. Okay. I, now there's a feeling within the program that the structure and scheme is okay. The, the, and what Frost has said, I say three times now is that most of the problem lies in the people who touch the ball, the punter, the place kicker, the return man, that you don't see long snapper problems. Coverage has been good across I would say pretty much across the board, right? Wouldn't you say that? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not like they're having kicks blocked, punts blocked. Um, they got close to blocking a punt against Ohio State um, inches. They, I know within the program, they feel okay about where, they, where they've come from. But Baz, you laid it out pretty well. I mean, the, there's a lot of strong evidence that suggests what what the what you got to get much better. I just wonder if this is more about recruiting specialists. Like, there's a, there's a conversation that never comes up at in this market, and that is why doesn't Nebraska devote scholarships um, to punters, place kickers, and long snap? Um, now they now now I know people have said well they who's that kid that uh, used to wear the Christmas sweater that they had um, Barrett uh, Barrett Pickering yeah um, yeah um, <laughs> he wore Barrett the Christmas Pickering. sweater like around Christmas to be fair. yeah it was nice and, and that, it was a nice one. <laughs> the, the uh, it was uh, now he was a scholarship kicker um, but well they gave one they gave one to Daniel Cherney it just hasn't worked hasn't worked they gave it a run yeah. And it could work eventually. I mean, he's just a young guy from Australia and he's learning the game. So some of it's given it to the right guy too, but the, yeah. I don't know, there's, it is, um, it's complicated. I'm not, I'm not sold on the idea that you have to, I guess that's my position. Somebody would have to sell me a little harder. You know, yeah. it's one of the things that's interesting about this is like, they looked for the anal, you know, an analyst um, yeah. for the 2020 season. Two of the guys who were involved in that were Sean Snyder and and Dan Jackson. Dan Jackson's an Omaha guy. He's a special teams coordinator at Northern Illinois now, and he also coaches a position. Sean Snyder at USC, special teams, all he does, you know. Um, like Bill, Bill Bush, who's on the staff now as an analyst, for the most part, when he's handled special teams in the past, he's also coached outside linebackers, coached safeties or whatever. Like 
that's the structure that Nebraska has right now with Mike Dawson. Mm-hmm. So I just think I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I tend to agree with you, Sipple. I think the if you get the specialist right next year, a lot of the problems are solved. Hey, now, and, and people I know that are listening right now are, are just waiting for somebody, Baz, to bring this up. Mike Riley had a special teams coach, a dedicated special teams coach, yeah. Bruce Reed. And I would say it wasn't – it didn't go all that well. Well, yeah, especially for the money they were paying him. Right. It was, it was a, And for people that forgot, it was a very odd look. Parker, were you there when Bruce nope. Reed was there? Nope. Okay, Parker, it was bizarre in times covering a bowl game, the Foster Farms Bowl. Um, I, I wouldn't make this up. I saw it. We, we were able to go to a practice, and Bruce Reed did the special teams early in the practice and was gone. Just, I mean, he worked for 40 minutes and was gone. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very odd – when you have a dedicated special teams coach, it tends to be an odd look. Um, and – People were, hey, I got to tell you, people were uncomfortable with that picture. He's making $450,000, and he's, he's not at practice a lot of the time or shows up, shows up when they're working on special teams, and that's all. Now, I'm not saying Bruce always did that, but there, were, there was that conversation. It was odd. I'm, I'm, I almost feel better about a special teams coach that's coaching something else. You're, you, guys are, you guys are bringing me around on the idea. So we we'll had see. Nebraska had one. They had a special yeah. teams coach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, like Parker said, it comes down to having the right specialists, right? It's just like, it comes down to having the right tackles on offense. It comes down to having the right quarterback, the right running back. Like you got the right guys. Like that, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And it, it doesn't matter how you coach it or how you scheme it up. If it's the, it's the, the, the Jimmy's and the Joe's like we talked about with everybody else. And if you have those guys in place, Nebraska had those guys in place for a lot of years and their special teams look pretty good. And, and now they don't. And they, yeah. and the special teams. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. There's a coach who said, who was telling me that it, in his place, their, their scheme and structure was terrible, but they had a great return man and great punter and great kicker. And it masked yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah, your average fan cannot watch like a kickoff and a return and say like, "Wow, the scheme of the coverage unit is really bad." No, like obvious. It's obvious if a guy rips off a hundred yarder, obviously that something went wrong. But you don't. You know, I was I was talking to someone the other day and I asked if it looked different. You know, Nebraska. You know, twenty twenty to this year, and just guy just laughed. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, looks a little different. Like hey, scheme wise, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. That's not something. You know, especially watching the television you know, broadcast of games when you watch it back. Like, you just don't see – they don't show all the guys running down and the, the lane integrity right. guys in coverage and all yeah. that. It's a difficult thing to know unless you're – unless you really, you know, know what, what's going on and, and are focused on that specifically and can see something besides TV. Well, we know that the only egregious bust was a punter punting it literally 40 yards from his target against Michigan State. We haven't mm-hmm. seen egregious coverage busts like we have in the past, right? No. Yeah, John Bullock, no. John Bullock covered one up against Ohio State because Smith yeah. and Jigbo was going to – had, you know, it was a wrong – I think it was a wrong side or a, a little bit of a miss hit, and he had a lot of green in front of him, but the kid, the walk-on, made a great tackle to get him to the ground. So, you know, you got, if you make the plays, um, it's sort of like the specialist conversation. You make the play in crunch time, a lot of the issues go away. Okay, Baz is kicking at the stall right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Well, no, we got, we got a little we got a little more football to talk yet. I, I can kick I can kick around a little more. Well, you want to talk the strangeness of the last two weeks? Oh yeah. Um, coming off a bye, and and you said it, Sip, and I agree with you. It, it almost feels like the season is over a little bit, and there's still two <laughs> games left with, with, with everything that's happened. And so Nebraska is going to Wisconsin. They're going to play the number one defense in the country. Two weeks after they played the number one offense in the country, Wisconsin's defense is giving up 30 fewer yards per game than Georgia's defense. And, and think about how dominant Georgia's defense is. Georgia's defense is the top scoring unit in the nation. Guess who's number two? Wisconsin. Uh, 14, a little over 14 points a game, 14 and a half points a game. They give up 60 rushing yards a game. It's it's just it, everything has been so strange. Well, it's been strange around here for a while, but these last two weeks, it's been very strange. And this game, you know, a, a supposed rivalry game, a, a going to Camp Randall, a resurgent Wisconsin team. It almost feels like an afterthought a little bit, right, with, with everything that's gone on the last couple of weeks. 
I think so. Um, maybe it won't as much as Friday approaches and Saturday, but yeah, I, yeah. Mean, I mean, there's been a lot of, um, I mean, there's just a lot of tumult. <laughs> there's a lot of tumult last week and it, it did feel kind of weird. Like, and it was like, you know, it was a bye week So that contributed to the feeling too, but yeah, it's, you know, they're three and nine. Yeah. They're three and nine. Um, they're playing a team that has a ton to play for, but it doesn't feel like on Nebraska side, there's a lot of buzz about the game, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, it, what comes to mind is this. If I were, if I were involved directly, like a player, man, it would, I think it would drive you to beat Wisconsin and make that Iowa game more meaningful. I mean, if you could finish with wins against Wisconsin and Iowa as a senior, you would say, you know what? We did make some mark here. I mean, we did, we left, at least we left with wins and trophy games against game, against teams we haven't beaten. And that would, I think that would be really meaningful. Of course, people can diminish it. Um, that's what people tend to do with everything. But it would be pretty meaningful to, for those kids to get that done. I thought Ben Stilley had a great quote Monday up in the hallway in Memorial Stadium. He said, he was talking about his class and the older guys on the team. And, and he said in, in the, the typical Ben Stilley, very, you know, monotone, serious way, he said, yeah, uh, my class hasn't had a lot of, a lot of overwhelmingly joyous moments playing football <laughs> and beating, beating Wisconsin, beating Iowa gives you two pretty good, pretty good moments. Oh, wow. to go out in, you know, especially yeah. for a guy like Ben, who's, who's been around forever and has seen some, some pretty low times. So yeah, there's, you would think Sip that you're right. You would think there's some motivation there for those guys to not that there isn't already, but to beat Wisconsin to really make that Iowa game meaningful in a couple of weeks. Even, even Ben, who they called grandpa in the locker room, wasn't around the last time Nebraska beat Wisconsin. The last time I was wrote about this today, the last time Nebraska beat Wisconsin, uh, Taylor Martinez threw a touchdown to Kyler Reed to get him within three oh, points. Oh, my God. Get him within really? three points. Yeah, and then Brett Maher kicked a game-tying field goal and a go-ahead field goal. Bro, Kyler Reed was still playing? Yeah. Kyler Reed, 47. Yeah, Kyler, Kyler Reed's like – Kyler Reed has three grandkids now. I met That's Kyler Reed. I met Kyler Reed. He was coaching junior colleges, I think. I met him a couple of years ago down in Kansas. And uh, yeah, Where's he, he coaching? Was, well, he was at – Wow, where'd Keem Green go? Highlands? Yeah, I think he was at Highlands a couple of years ago. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he is now. Interesting. Yeah. All right, we gotta get yeah, going. It's, it's, people are piling in here. People are piling, piling in. Look at your palatial estate. Yeah. yeah. This is the simple compound. Um, yeah, let's see. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap this baby up quick with some with some uh, basketball thoughts. Nebraska loses to Creighton last night, 77-69. Lose Trey McGowan's to a broken foot. McGowan's had surgery today, out six to eight weeks. Uh, that news just came out right before we got started here. That puts him on a on a timetable for an early January, mid-January return. He's missing a minimum 10 games. Um, probably gonna be, I mean, probably more than that if you if you if you take it longer than six weeks. Nebraska's one and two, uh, not too far away from being 0-3, uh, if we're being honest. And they were down 19 points 10 minutes into the game last night. It was it was not pretty. For all we heard in the in the offseason about how this team was going to be different, this team was going to be more talented, this team was going to be a better shooting, better depth, hasn't showed up yet. And, and Nebraska has not looked good. They've looked they've looked uh, disorganized. I think they've looked undisciplined. And I think you saw some of that come out last night. And this is where Sipple said I was kicking at the stall a little bit. And just some things I noticed last night, I, I've seen a few people kind of talk about them today on social media. You know, a couple of Nebraska players wearing blue shoes when you're playing Creighton uh, and it, Nebraska calling for a red out and then wearing white uniforms. An entire, the entire first row of one of the baselines has Creighton students in it. And that's small stuff. That stuff doesn't, no. doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't make a difference in winning or losing, but it may be, it maybe kind of illustrates where this program is at right now. It feels like there's almost a disconnect somewhere, you know, you it's, and the, the, the shoes thing is probably just an old man grumbling about stuff, but I mean, come on, what are you doing? Like you're wearing, I don't know if it is. I don't think it Creighton. is. Yeah. And, and you, you watch Creighton warm up and they all have the same shoes, the same warm ups. you know, there's a, there's a purpose to what they're doing. And then the game starts, and what happens? Creighton is surgical in its execution. 
Creighton is running its stuff in a very hostile environment with a very young team with a lot of freshmen having to replace five starters from last year. And like I said, Nebraska looks disorganized offensively. They look, they look undisciplined defensively and offensively, bad communication on defense, bad switches, losing guys in transition. You know, that whole run in the first half, and Fred Hoiberg said it was because Nebraska didn't play transition defense. They lost Creighton's three-point shooters. They let a true freshman point guard, Ryan Nimhard, control the pace. And, and Nebraska's point guard is a fifth-year senior and struggled again mightily. And so, yeah, it was just – it was just – you, you see those things and you, you kind of, you kind of tilt your head at them a little bit and then you watch the game play out and you go, well, maybe those things are connected somehow. And again, that stuff maybe doesn't make the difference between winning or losing, but it, it might play a part. And it's just, it's just one of those things where Nebraska needs to be as tight as it can be right now. The margin for error is very small and, and doing stuff like that. You don't look like you're a tight ship. You, there, there's some kind of, there's some, there's some frayed edges there and some disorganization. So that, that's just some stuff I noticed last night and kind of sucked on it and thought about today. And it, it just, it was at the end of the day, it was a bad look for Nebraska a starting that game the way they did B losing and then C all that stuff. I just talked about, and yes, they made a great rally to make that a game, but look, that game was over at the 10 minute mark and it's, that's, that's what it is. Oh, I think what you just laid out is I think it makes a lot of sense and not just because I like the fact that there's somebody else shaking their fist at the clouds either. I, I, um, I think it's, I think it's more than that. I think it, it, you're absolutely right. Um, especially when you, especially because the juxtaposition was so close that Creighton, you're right. Creighton looks just more cohesive. It looks more like, a, you know, there's, there's a team element to it and yeah, blue shoes. I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't notice it, but now, now that you mentioned it, I, I did see it. It didn't, it didn't really register with me, but now that you mention it, I, I wouldn't like that. If I was a player, yeah. I'd say, what the hell, why are you wearing blue shoes? I mean, trying to make a statement here. What's the deal? Um, and, and look, I get that. I get that Fred Hoiberg is look, he's made, he's not been shy about this. They've run it like an NBA organization, right? Like there's a lot of player freedom. There's a lot of both on the court and off. There's a lot of allowing guys to kind of be themselves and do what they want to do. This isn't an NBA program. This is Nebraska basketball where you're, you don't have a lot of history of success and you're trying to build, you're trying to build something and build something sustainable. And some of that starts with those little things. And, you know, how do you build discipline? Well, you, you hammer the details, right? You hammer the small stuff. Uh, what kind of shoes are you wearing? What kind of uniforms are we wearing tonight if we're calling for a red out? And, Things like that. So, look again. Nebraska didn't lose because they wore white uniforms, or a couple guys wore blue shoes, or whatever. That stuff, I think, at the end of the day, matters, especially in a college program where it's it's about building the program and sustaining the program. This is, it, it, and I get Fred has an NBA background, and he's going to run it like he wants to run it, and he certainly knows more, more about basketball than I do. But look, I saw what I saw last night. I saw a disorganized, undisciplined team, and, and I think those things are connected somehow. My best. Thank you for that. That was interesting. And they, they got to get that point guard issue solved and they're not, you know, they're not getting a lot from their bigs either. So there's a lot, you know, they're very wing oriented. Um, they do have some shooters. Um, but you saw it, you saw Creighton consistently get good shots and you saw Nebraska consistently struggle to get good shots. I, yeah, there was, one play last night, somebody clipped it, and and I, and I forget who it was now, so I apologize. But they, they clipped when Creighton was making that earlier on. It was when Creighton's transition threes, and they did a little hand, just a simple handoff at the top of the key, and the guy was wide open. And you can see Doc Sather in the background just absolutely smack a chair as hard as he can. It's it's not like they're not – the coaches aren't trying to drill this into these guys. But there's – there's it's kind of like football, right? There's a disconnect there somewhere where, where the coaching isn't, isn't equaling execution on the court. So look, it's three games into the year. There's a long, 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 long way to go. And maybe Nebraska turns this thing around and looks like a totally different team at the end of the year. They're playing a lot of guys that don't have a lot of college experience, but they're also playing some guys that have played a lot of college shoots too. So yeah. there's, there's a mix there, you know, you know yeah, Sorry, they, go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead. You know, what I noticed the doc reaction that I noticed was at the end of the first half, 
when Nebraska could have held for the, the last shot or you know, very close to the last shot. And they pushed it ahead, and, and Fred was yelling, you know, slow it down, slow it down. They threw it to the corner, Keon Edwards missed a three. And when, when Creighton brought the ball back up with, like, nine seconds left or whatever, Doc was, like, just hands behind his head. Like, could yeah, it's one of those things. It's just, like you say, it's it's a little play. And yeah. they Discipline. follow the guy made one out of two. It cost him one point. Obviously, the margin was more than that. But it's one of those things, right? Like, you yeah, it was a one-point like, game, and Crane made three free throws in the last minute of the first half. And, yeah. and Nebraska came up empty, you know? What's not a small detail is I can guarantee you it's not a small detail what Creighton did in transition early to blow that game open early. Yeah, right. um, That was transition. They were getting what they wanted in transition. That's what Fred said. And you know that – come on, you're playing Creighton. You know yeah. transition defense is gigantic. And it he was, said after the game it was the number one – he said it was the number one thing they emphasized. Yeah, but it speaks to what Baz is talking about. There's a there's a disconnect, lack of discipline, and that's what Fred has to address. Hey, yeah, uh, that's simple. Why. Oh, go ahead, Baz. Go ahead. Was, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Parker. Um, we've said we've d- described Nebraska basketball in a lot of ways, not many of them flattering. One of them is the same way I would describe you. Do you know which one it is? What's that? It's not dis- It's not undisciplined. It's not disorganized. But I've. I, I know where you like to go to dinner and I would refer to you as being wing oriented. <laughs> wow. I am wing oriented. Wow. You went a yeah. long way to get there, Parker, but I think it was worth it. <laughs> you <end>. like Fred <laughs> Hoiberg's program are wing yeah. oriented. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely wing oriented. You are wing. You know what? I'm kind of wing oriented too. Now that, I, now that we mentioned that. Yeah. So. I like bone, bone in wings, Cajun dry rub bone in wings. There it is. All right. On that note, let's get out of here before we go completely off the rails. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We'll have more next week after Nebraska plays Wisconsin and gets ready for Thanksgiving, day after Thanksgiving against Iowa. Until then, we'll, we'll talk to you soon.